more uh, popular schools that we've had inquiries in, uh, schools ranging from Exeter, Andover, um, on the East Coast to Kate and Thatcher, um, as well as some of the schools that uh, uh, you can consider, such as uh, the Berkshire School and uh, Northfield Mount Hermon. Uh, so just to read a few, um, I won't bore you with all the details, and we will go through them a little bit more. Um, for example, Groton's motto is to inspire lives of character, scholarship, leadership, and service within a diverse, inclusive, and close-knit community. Um, another one for Exeter is, Exeter today continues the commitment to unite knowledge and goodness. It seeks students with, who combine proven academic intellectual curiosity and tenacity with decency and good character. So it takes a while for a lot of these schools to pick these mission statements and their motto. Um, they do pick their words very carefully. Uh, so we will parse through them uh, in the upcoming slides. So the key themes that I've noticed in, um, in these mission statements would be the first one, academic excellence, service, leadership, community, and within the community, the, the art in detail in the upcoming slides, uh, but just wanted to give you a brief overview of uh, what, uh, a brief summary of all the, uh, all the mottos. So academic excellence. At the end of the day, you're here in boarding school to learn and the school is looking for smart people who want to learn and people who can follow their rigorous uh, curriculum. Um, for the most part, you can look at the, the league tables and have a look at what, uh, what are the top ranked schools, what their college matriculation is. Um, and a lot of you are definitely looking at these schools as a point for you to get to a top university in the US or in the UK. Um, but don't forget, you do have four years to go through. So within these four years, um, yeah, the curriculum is extremely rigorous, and they say so in their, um, in their uh, mission statements. So for example, with St. Paul's, it is a fully residential academic community that pursues the highest ideals of scholarship. Choate makes it even more clear, a rigorous academic curriculum and an emphasis on the formation of character. With mm -hmm. Hotchkiss, uh, they're a little bit less strong, strongly worded about their rigor, but then it is still about learning. Um, we believe a healthy and inclusive learning community nourishes students physically, emotionally, and intellectually, fosters joy in learning and living with others. Right. Middlesex, another great school, has been committed to excellence in the intellectual, ethical, creative, and physical development of young people. And another popular school, NMH, Northfield Mount Hermon. Our mission is to engage the intellect, compassion, and talents of our students. And of course, uh, last but not least, Exeter, which we know is a very, very academically strong school, continues the commitment to unite knowledge and goodness. And they do very clearly state proven academic ability. So definitely something uh, to think about. So academic excellence, as I mentioned, the rigorous curriculum. A lot of feedback that I get from my students once they go from schools in Hong Kong to the US high school. Uh, high school is inherently challenging and these boarding schools even more so. Um, they, they go through, I think the running joke among people who have gone to these boarding schools tend to say that every teacher thinks you're only taking their class. So they, once they admit you, they, they believe that you can handle this and they do want to work hard to ensure that you, you can handle um, the curriculum. In addition to that, they want to see the love of learning and intellectual curiosity. So how do they measure that? How do they measure proven academic ability? So obviously grades. Um, and a lot of parents do ask me, oh, you know, he, his grades aren't very good in, um, uh, Bible studies or, or other subjects, there's definitely an emphasis on core subjects, uh, math and English. Uh, so uh, be sure that those are strong. Uh, those are definitely the scores that we look at as well. 
um, they look at test scores. SSAT, ISEE, TOEFL, if you go to a school um, that is not uh, English medium or if your primary language is not English. Teacher recommendation letters, that's one way for them to see how you perform. Um, and they, uh, all of these schools require a math teacher, your current math teacher and your current English teacher. Uh, one thing about the uh, recommendation letter that I would, I would say here is that um, it is very, very involved. There's, um, there's a list of questions that they ask about um, their curriculum at school. Uh, they do talk about where the student ranks among, among their peers and, um, and maybe just a few comments. So that's definitely something to keep in mind that it's not uh, a cookie cutter letter, but uh, that you have to list out, the teachers have to list out exactly what they cover in their math class or the English class and, um, and what type of rigor it is, especially if it's a school that doesn't usually send kids to boarding schools. Uh, so a little bit of numbers. Um, definitely don't take these as gospel. They're taken off of uh, boarding school review, um, but just for some of the more competitive schools, and if they do list them, they're meeting an SSAT score. So it's a general overview. Um, these numbers are obviously not a guarantee, but can give you a sense of the competitiveness and, um, and where your student stands. Um, these acceptance rates as well, uh, keep in mind that they include legacy students, underrepresented minorities, athlete recruits, um, um, and others, students that may have other spikes. Uh, so when you come back, uh, unfortunately, the acceptance rate, uh, you might have to take off about eight to 10% from this acceptance rate. Um, so some schools, because of COVID-19, are going to test optional. Um, it is on a school by school basis. So if you are looking at applying this fall, uh, definitely go on the website, go into the info sessions. Uh, they are very clear about that. Um, there are some schools that still want you to submit. Um, for example, TAP sees it as um, a key factor uh, in terms of their admissions. Um, but test optional is, I, I feel like, is a double-edged sword because if a student is able to take it, uh, the SSAT, um, they will probably, and they do well, they will probably submit it. Um, so it's this weird thing uh, Yes, game theory a little bit, um, where do you submit your score? Is your score good enough? And and so if you are able to take the SSAT and if you're based in Hong Kong, um, they've actually released a lot of test dates. I think they have two in September and then the usual October, November, December test dates. I would highly recommend you still take those tests. Um, and just another note for parents who may not be applying this fall, um, you do have to take the SSAT uh, the year you are applying. So if you are applying uh, to be admitted in fall of 2021, you would have to take the SSAT between September to January of 2020 in leadership. Uh, we've been drilled when I went to TAP. The TAP school's motto is non CB administrator said administrat, not to be served, but to serve. Um, Deerfield also talks about leadership um, in a rapidly changing world. Andover's motto as well as non cb not for self. St. Mark's, also very competitive. As you can see, they do have the word educate, but the focus is on leadership and service. Kent School, um, the growth of honorable, responsible citizens for our country and our diverse world. And Loomis, commitment to the best self and the common good. So what do I mean by service? And a lot of parents talk to me about how much volunteer work a student should be doing. Um, so in normal times, we would typically um, ask students to, a lot of schools definitely have these programs, school-sponsored uh, service trips, or, um, or I know for HKIS in grade eight, you're supposed to do a week of service. Um, and a lot of these it, are to allow the student an opportunity to serve and to understand, um, because we all live in a world of privilege, um, the greater world around us, our community in Hong Kong or beyond. Um, so there's no right amount of hours for you, 
it's more about your involvement, your takeaways, your personal reflection, and the idea that you are aware that there is a world outside beyond, um, beyond our uh, community. Uh, with leadership, um, we are well aware that the kids are young, they're 13 or 14. Um, some of them may have had the opportunity to be um, in student government, um, serve as class representatives, um, maybe captain of, of a basketball team or a sports team. So demonstrated leadership um, for sure is there. Uh, but if your, your child um, hasn't really had the opportunity, then they look for qualities, your, your personal qualities. So does, does your child take the initiative? Are they responsible? Um, are they accountable? Are they respectful? Do they have that communication skills? Um, the ways to see that would be through your interviews. Um, so you would be interview you have to interview with boarding schools. Um, your teacher recommendations and school recommendations, um, your essays. So for both service and leadership, uh, there will be question uh, prompts about uh, serving your community. And then also the parent statements. So I talked a little bit about community. And so boarding school, you're in a class of about 100 to 200 kids, multiplied by that, that's a school of 600 kids uh, to 1,000 for the larger schools, um, and the teachers. So it's a very enclosed, very close-knit community, and they're looking for how you would fit into it. So for Berkshire School, the community fosters diversity. Um, Hotchkiss talks about a healthy and inclusive learning community where everyone is safe, seen, and supported. Choate talks about teachers and students living with one another and learning from each other. And uh, within Kate uh, School in California, uh, each member is contributing to the spirit of the place. Um, Lawrenceville also talks about the diverse community of promising young people. So, how would you uh, contribute to this community? Um, do you have something to offer? Sports, art, creativity, creative writing? Will you start a new club? Are you an active member? So whenever we start talking to um, students that are a little bit young, it's okay, but um, think about how, what clubs you would be joining, um, and then what other um, skills you might have. Um, so. I have a student who is a big in um, well, a big in soccer, uh, football, and um, she's actively talking to uh, coaches. So schools do look for communication. You're talking with them, um, and they're very open to meeting different types of students. Um, for example, if you play um, ice hockey and and they're looking for a goalie in ice hockey. Um, then it is a perfect opportunity for you to start talking to coaches, send some of your highlight reels. Uh, that's something that um, a lot of students should consider, um, especially if the school is looking for that. Um, and then the question, I think, is have you engaged in your community? Um, and given COVID-19 again, I understand, you know, with service, with leadership, with community, with club involvement, um, it's quite difficult because we've been locked down for so long. Um, so they're looking for how else, what else have you been doing? Um, you know, we, we read about stories about students who go on their balconies. We live in very cramped quarters, but um, every night at, at 7 p.m., they take out their saxophone and they serenade their neighbors just to uplift the spirit. Um, I, I really think that when you start thinking about the people around you and how you make, how we all make our lives um, more positive uh, with, with, um, with something like COVID, um, that is something that you should share with, um, with the school. Um, and there's always, if there's no essay prompt that allows you to do so, um, there's always the additional information section where you can do that. So once you have all of this, once you've built your perfect profile, your kids have the grades, the test scores, and all the extracurricular involvement, um, there is something uh, called demonstrated interest. And this is huge in some universities and also in boarding schools. Um, because when you think about it, a lot of these uh, parents are, um, uh, a lot of these students have the grades, they have everything already, 
and you want to go to boarding school. So you apply to all of these schools, but how do they know that you're definitely going and how do they know that you're absolutely keen on their school? Um, so there is a thing called demonstrated interest, which is, um, you, know, you can read the definition, soft quality that admissions officers consider during the application. And it could be a lot of actions, but you have to show that you are enthusiastic and curious and passionate about the school you're applying to. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, communicating with the school. Um, I'm not saying bombard them with emails, but definitely reach out if you have any questions, real burning questions that you need to ask. Um, you know, there are real people on the other side and they will be answering any questions that you may have. Um, if you're curious about some of their dance facilities or their sports or their arts or anything, um, feel free to reach out and see if um, there is a teacher who might who might respond to you. Um, they might refer you to somebody. Um, if you've got an interest in STEM and you're curious about the makerspace, um, um, that's another thing that you should reach out and say, oh, I've, I've been in these robotics competitions. I really want to continue my interest in robotics. Is there something that I can do? Um, that is also a way for you to show that you are very keen on this school. Um, on the surface, all of these schools might look the same, beautiful red bricks, lush green fields, um, but each school does have their signature programs. Um, for example, Cho has um, an art concentration. Um, they do have a very in-depth science program as well. Um, so be sure to look into them and ask real questions about like why you would be interested in this school. Um, however, after you've done all your research, if there is one school that you are particularly keen on, um, it doesn't hurt to communicate that to the school, either in your interview, um, either in your essays or in the parent statement. We are very keen on Hotchkiss, and if we get in, we will absolutely go. Uh, don't do that for multiple schools because uh, these communities do talk to one another. Uh, but if there is a number one choice, for sure, I would, I would absolutely um, recommend you um, you say something. Um, if, if your grades aren't there, then it's not going to be the deciding factor, but if you are neck and neck with somebody, that might be something that pushes you along. Um, so one of the most important factors uh, to, uh, for boarding school applications are their essays. Um, as I mentioned, essays it, it, it's interesting because I I talked I've talked to a lot of students who are writing essays and they all have been used to the academic side of writing. Um, to prove this point, I have three things I want to say: A is this, B is this, C is this. Um, but at the end of the day, the school is looking to differentiate you from all these resumes, all these report cards, and all of these other factors that you can only understand on paper. So, how do you show what kind of a person? And remember, they're building a community of humans. So there will be the, um, the outgoing, popular people, there will be the very focused science people, and there will be the athletes. It's supposed to be one well-rounded community, and everyone is um, everyone has a role to play. So how do you showcase your, um, your personality and your passion for the school? So a very common essay that uh, these schools will ask is, why X boarding school? Um, every school has one way or another of asking this, either in your essays or in the parent statements. Um, so so for, on one hand, you have, I am interested in attending X boarding school because of its location, uh, um, the facilities, uh, a beautiful campus. Um, that is something that, uh, you know, every single school probably sounds like this. So you could probably copy and find and replace and replace the school's name into this. As a budding engineer, I'm excited about the STEM robotics program at X boarding school because I can explore other ways to build robots, machines. Talk about your specific interest, tie it back to something about the school, and showcase why the student is a fit. So, um, so Alice had just asked a question, how do schools view essays that are crafted? Uh, because many 13-year-olds probably don't write like this. Very true. Um, don't, don't be too heavy handed when you are proofreading your essays. Um, and I highly recommend for students to have someone read through them. But at the same time, it is very important to preserve an authentic voice. Uh, yes, word choice, um, 
word choice matters because the vocabulary of a 13 year old is very different from the vocabulary of an 18 year old or a 30 plus year old. Um, so make sure that, um, so this is definitely something uh, more college focused, but at the same time, um, you can still write in a way that is true to you. So whenever I talk to some of my students about this, I, I basically say, think of this as you talking to um, a family friend or a teacher. Um, so a teacher that you're familiar with. So you're not super stilted, but at the same time, you're not super casual. So you wouldn't say, OMG, I love the STEM robotics program at, at uh, Berkshire uh, because it is just like super cool. You would probably, when you talk to a teacher, you would say, I, I really love building robots. Um, you know, I have built robots since I was, I was a kid. I was building with Legos at first, then I moved on to um, Roblox. I moved on to Minecraft. I love building a world. Um, and I believe that I want to take this to um, to the to boarding school where you have whatever the robotics program is called. So that is a way to make it a bit more conversational. Another way to do that is potentially to have your student record himself or herself talking um, and then take away all the likes and ums and you probably have a sense of what their voice could be. Um, another popular essay, and this is more for um, your personality as well as showing kind of the breadth of the books that you read. Um, an interesting, so this is one, an interesting book I read this year is To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. It is about a lawyer, Atticus Finch, who defends a black man in the deep south in 1933. Very interesting and I really enjoyed learning about an important part of history. Um, so it's a book report, um, which Everyone has everyone who is at these boarding schools have probably read To Kill a Mockingbird. But what the school is interested in is not the fact that you read it and you're able to regurgitate the plot summary, but what you got out of it. Um, so I had a student uh, this past year um, also uh, applying to boarding school um, who took English and read To Kill a Mockingbird. And um, to this student, the main character, Scout and Jem, um, that, that student felt a very strong affinity with Scout and Jem and relating to them as their innocent world um, had changed. And similarly, the student felt a huge shift in the dynamics between uh, different populations, different people in Hong Kong. So you're able to tie it um, to something about you, something that's happening to you. It feels very real. Um, uh, I think I had another student who wrote about Malala and, and how um, she couldn't believe that a, a student, a, a girl her age could, could have the bravery to, to stand up to, um, to, uh, to, to the oppression that she's feeling. So um, has to reveal something about you. And this is a way to show your personality and your potential uh, for leadership. Um, so how Baker and Bloom can help. Um, in terms of, uh, of the academic engagement and um, curios intellectual curiosity, we do offer inspired projects, which is where a student takes six months to build something. So we, we've definitely had a lot of STEM projects, but we've also had a lot of creative writing projects where you work closely with a coach one-on-one -on -one and um, you create something. Um, so there's always a start and a finish. Um, you write the project proposal with your coach and then you do your research or you write your initial draft and then you meet with the coach uh, every, every once every month to go over um, the writing or check in on the project and redirect. And then at the end, you either have a project proposal or you have a finished product. Um, we, we've done apps, we've done research on the pangolin, we've done marine biology. Um, so that is something that we can definitely help with. Academic writing. Uh, so writing in um, local schools and in international schools um, in middle school is very different from um, academic writing uh, in boarding schools. So um, what we offer, um, and we actually had just started the new term, is an academic writing course that allows you to write and think critically. Um, so you would read through uh, similar sample passages that you would in boarding schools, and you would write an expository essay um, usually the five paragraph model, but um, 
mostly to ensure that you are making a point and you are supporting it with evidence. Test prep, um, so we're, we have a great team of um, test prep coaches who can help you with, um, with any of the tests uh, that you would need. Um, in terms of essays and parent statement preparation. So um, I walked you a little bit through essays, um, but parent statements are also extremely important. Um, a lot of these uh, parent, sample parent statements do ask you to reflect a little bit about how your student will contribute to um, their community, how they currently contribute to their community, and, um, and what are things that you feel like um, your student needs to develop and what are their strengths. So it's not just tell me how awesome your kid is, it is reflect carefully on um, how you've dealt with um, uh, your child, when, how have they struggled, what are the challenges that they've had, um, and how have they overcome this challenge. So it, it's, it's a bit tricky and there's always a word limit, so that's something that we can help you with as well. Um, portfolio support, if, you're, if your child is an artist, um, or even uh, someone with technical ability, uh, we definitely recommend uh, submitting a portfolio as well. Um, so we can help pick the artwork, we can help with the caption writing, um, that's something that we can offer as well. Um, interview preparation, um, again, what do you want the schools to know about you? So we, we can definitely talk through some sample questions um, and then um, refine the answers. Um, we're definitely not here to completely coach them because at the same time, um, these college admissions officers have seen everything. So it, it's nice to have a healthy conversation with them, um, an active one where there's, um, and, and so we don't like to coach because if suddenly they're thrown a question that's not on script, we don't want the student to freeze completely. And in general, just overall coaching and mentoring, um, we have noticed that even for uh, all these school applications, it is quite stressful. So understanding um, where the student is, um, is very important um, for the child's well-being as well. That, so that is what US boarding schools are looking for. And without further ado, I will pass you on to Rory, who will walk you through what UK schools are looking for. Thank you, Karen. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, it's quite interesting listening, listening to what you've been, you've been saying. And what struck me is, um, if, particularly if you were looking at both American schools and at UK schools, how everything seems to be far less clear when it comes to the UK schools. And there is so much, which is, of course, typically British. There's so much that's undersaid or that's simply not said at all. And it's, it's, it's quite tricky working out what these uh, UK schools are hunting for. And one of the obvious answers uh, to what UK schools are looking for is to, is to say, and, and, and maybe this is just a, a cop-out from, from my point of view, but it, it varies. And it varies tremendously from, from one school to another. There are so many boarding schools uh, in the UK. And what you need to do initially is to work out, okay, so the schools will certainly be looking for particular characteristics or they'll be looking for certain types of students and so on. But remember, you're looking as well. You're part of this process. You are selecting schools at the same time. And one of the starting points, and, and particularly right now, is you're going to look at the school profile as it's presented to you online, on their web sites and so on and I would say from your point of view be forensic when you are looking at these schools and try to work out does that school fit with the image that I have of my boy or my girl and, and or likewise spin that around and say does my boy or my girl fit with that particular school or at least how it, how it is being presented and um, one of the other differences that it just struck me while Karen was talking was that the UK schools um, have a, a five-year program. Now, some of them even have a seven-year program. So a school like Wickham Abbey, for instance, will start off at age 11 plus, run right through to 18. Uh, most of the, all, all of the boys' schools and most of the co-ed schools run a program that runs from age 13 up to 18. So that's a five-year program. And of course, another, a very popular time uh, to move schools as far as the UK is concerned 
is for the final two years at age uh, 16 plus. Okay, now Karen is moving my slides on for me, so um, if, if she gets it wrong, I'll complain, but um, <laughs> that's absolutely perfect. Now, what is quite different, and, and, and again, it's something that Karen picked up on the American schools. It's quite interesting that when you look at these, there are subtle differences in tone. Uh, and, so, and sometimes this uh, difference is not that subtle, but uh, they do spend this uh, a, a huge amount of time looking at these strap lines, looking at these statements, and, and they give clues as to what the schools are all about. Now, if you look at these, Winchester College, one of the top academic schools, highly selective, and it talks about celebrating the individual. And that is right on the front page of their website. And I think in, in many ways, it does sum up the school. And if I have a really interesting intellectual youngster who could be seen as being quite quirky, Winchester will certainly be on my list in, in terms of advising the parents. And then you see a school like rugby, and I've deliberately, uh, I deliberately chose rugby as a school. I'm, I'm coming down 20, 30, 40 positions even on, on league tables. Remember these league tables also include the uh, Metropolitan Day Schools, those big day schools in London, which are so selective. And, and rugby state right at the beginning that they educate the whole person. And they say the whole person, the whole point. Now, a Winchester would claim that they do exactly the same, but it's quite interesting that rugby put that out there right at the very beginning. And then we move on to a school like Wickham Abbey, one of the most selective girls' schools. And you find academic excellence is right there at the very beginning. You look at Benenden School, another girls' school, you, you might find that quite a number of pupils are applying to both. And Benenden are talking about a complete education. Now, does that mean that actually they're selecting different pupils? I think what, it, what it's doing is it's opening up the possibility, perhaps, to different pupils and to different uh, uh, types of pupils. Um, I think, to be honest, that most of the schools are looking for, for something pretty similar. But it's when you have a, a particular type of character that you really need to home in on the detail of uh, one or other school. And that's something that we find ourselves uh, doing all the time. So how do you find out more? Well, typically what you would say is you visit the websites, you go to the open days. At the moment, all of the open days are, are virtual open days, and you visit. And unfortunately, at the moment, we can't visit the schools, but that hopefully will change. So, so many of them stress this whole business of academic ability, and we have all seen the league tables. I deliberately have not made that um, clear enough for you to read, otherwise we would get fixated by the numbers very, very quickly. Uh, and this is a clear starting point for uh, most schools, and I suppose for the top 200 schools, you could say that this is the most important factor. Where does, where, where does this individual pupil sit in terms of our intake? Now, I've often said this to Hong Kong parents, that it isn't a level playing field. And when it comes to Hong Kong, I would have thought that the, it is many, many times more difficult gaining entry from Hong Kong into one of these UK schools. There is a huge demand. And on top of the demand that comes from Hong Kong, there is an increasing demand coming from mainland China. And what schools are going to do is they're going to uh, limit the numbers coming from any one nationality in any one year group or in any one boarding house. So, so that adds a, an extra pressure. If you are applying to the top ranked schools, the, these uh, ones that appear in the, towards the top of all of these league tables, they are hunting for real intellectual capacity. And, and this, is, this is something that they, they try to pick up on in a whole variety of different ways that we'll, we'll have a look at a little bit later. And the mid-range, what I would call the mid-range schools, my standard um, top quality co-ed boarding schools, they will be looking for pupils who are going to sit pretty comfor comfortably in, that, in the upper quartile of their, of their range. And then when you move on to 
those schools that are on the lower end of these league tables, that's where the academic level isn't quite as important and they are less interested in academic selection. What they're more interested in is can the school actually provide for this boy or this girl? And so there's a, a, a slight change there. Um, one question that I would ask is do these league tables reflect the quality of teaching or do they simply tell you how selective the school is from the point of entry? And I, and I think that is something that you need to be aware of and, and need to be wary of, particularly when you're looking at uh, some of these uh, boarding schools that may be 20, 30 places further down the list. I was talking to the deputy head of um, Aundel School the other evening, and we were just talking about league tables and, and, and about different schools. And I, I was talking about um, um, a girl who was applying to a particular school, which I won't mention, but the numbers, the numbers actually in the sixth form, in the final year, in that girl's school were about between 65 and 80, whereas at Aundel, the numbers were typically 180. And we were speculating that the top uh, 85 or whatever at Aundel would be at least as good as the total number that are at uh, this particular girl's school. Okay, anyway, let's move on to assessment. Now, if they are interested in uh, the academic profile of the individual, then how do they actually set about assessing these uh, pupils? In many ways, the UK system is quite brutal, and um, it's every school has its pretest, its first hurdle, and this is a filter, and you can't get away from the fact that that filter exists, and so your child is going to be assessed perhaps three years before, certainly at least two years before the point of entry. So a 13-year-old may well find that at the age of 10, he or she is being assessed in some form. And these pretests they come with different, different names. I've, I've listed three here, ISEB, that's the Independent Schools Examination Board. So that is a test that's used uh, commonly by lots and lots of the independent schools. CAT4 is a test that um, is, is used across the world in many different schools. UCASET is a relatively newcomer uh, onto the scene. It was designed specifically for overseas families that are approaching UK schools. And they all are pretty similar. They have a verbal and non-verbal and a mathematical uh, section. They're mainly designed by Two or three companies, GL, you may have heard of, CEM is, is another. And even where schools say they have their own um, uh, pretest or their own verbal reasoning or uh, verbal, non-verbal, mathematical reasoning test, it's likely to be designed by one of those companies. So there's a great deal of, of, of similarity <coughs> between these different tests. And sometimes schools will even say to me that, okay, we one of the ways that we would gauge whether uh, a girl or a boy is on the right level is have a look at the um, UCASET score, uh, have a look at the report that comes through from, from UCASET because it's quite similar to the test that we use. Now, there are some variations again in, in all of this in that some of the schools that are uh, selecting pupils in Hong Kong will come out to Hong Kong and when they do, they may end up at the, uh, at the top schools weekend run by Academic Asia, or they may have their own uh, entry process. They will set themselves up in one of the hotels in uh, Hong Kong and then do some non-stop interviewing over a period of three days. Now, frequently, <clears throat> ahead of that, there will have been some sort of filter. And quite a number will have demanded a particular pretest or there will be a pretest in Hong Kong that they're, they're using. Now at 16 plus, it's quite different. Uh, this is, uh, first of all, the um, lead in time, generally speaking, is much, much shorter. And it is a straightforward, open competition. For the IB schools, what they tend to do is generally um, uh, test 
applicants in their higher level subjects. And then the A-level schools tend to focus on uh, two or perhaps three of the A-level subjects that the individual will be studying or hopes to study at school. On top of that, a number of schools throw in a general paper. And the general paper is a mix of um, logic and philosophy. So there's, there's one section of it where there may be right answers, and there's another whole section of it where there may not be any right answers. And they're just looking to see how an individual is going to react to particular issues. There may be moral issues, societal issues, all sorts of things like this. Um, and then we come on to interviews. Now, <clears throat> interviews are held at every level, at 11 plus, 13 plus, 16 plus. And one of the real dangers here is when either coaches or parents try to script individuals uh, and try to prepare for all the possible answers. And this can be a real disaster. And certainly when I, whenever I was interviewing, um, almost regardless of age, I would come and ask these interviews from a, a, a slightly different um, side, different point of view. Often, I would ask pupils what they would miss most about Hong Kong. And you think, what has that got to do with academic selection? But it actually enables me to open up a, a whole line of discussion with the individual in terms of their background and their schooling and um, societal issues within Hong Kong and, and so on. Um, I suppose what I was trying to do was I was trying to put them slightly off guard and uh, get them to talk about uh, things that they hadn't been prepared for. What we hope is, as, as interviewers, what we hope is to see the character of the individual come through and to develop a conversation. I was talking to a, a girl just two evenings ago and she was about to have uh, an interview. Uh, with, a, with a couple of schools and I was explaining to her that actually what we were doing we, was we were just having an interesting, thoughtful conversation and she assumed that I would have set questions but I wouldn't assume that at all and I like the idea and many, many interviewers will like to see where this conversation can, goes, or can go. Because, of course, what we want to do is we want to engage with you and we want to see how you will react in a, a class, how you will perform as a sixth former in you know, my school. It takes time to develop these skills. And this is something that I would hope youngsters just develop in their conversations with teachers, with tutors, with parents over a period of time. And, and yes, you can give them guidelines. Of course you can give them guidelines as to uh, how this will work and, and how they should be prepared. Um, I worry a little bit when I see uh, the youngsters coming through, as I used to every year in, in, in Hong Kong, and I see them coming through absolutely prepped in terms of the questions that they expected me to ask and the answers that they expected to give. And then seeing them being thrown by questions that were a little bit um, offline, uh, it, it used to concern me slightly. Okay, let's, let's move on from just the academic. Schools, the UK schools always talk about this, this talent outside of the curriculum. What are they actually hunting for? And I, I've made that point very deliberately that the best schools are hunting for talent, not just training. And uh, as, as we all know, a grade 8 musician, one grade 8 musician, can be totally different to another grade 8 musician. I watched a um, uh, director of music um, on one occasion, and, and this again is, is, is very typical, where this particular boy uh, was playing his violin, and the director of music just stopped him after, after a, a period of time and said, that was lovely. Now, they talked then about the composer and how the composer might have been writing uh, this particular piece of music. And then the director of music uh, made the suggestion, well, what if he wasn't actually being quite aggressive or he 
he wasn't being uh, anxious and dynamic, that actually he was in a much, much softer mood. And would that change the way that you would play that particular piece of music? And so what he was trying to do, he, he was trying to explore, could this musician actually demonstrate emotion through the music? And, and could he actually change and was he flexible enough? In other words, did he have real genuine musicality? And likewise, when it comes to, uh, to something like art, they, what they don't want to see is beautifully finished pieces that are presented in frames and so on, because that actually tells you very little about the artist. What they want to know is, can this individual actually draw? Can they develop an idea? Can they develop a concept from it being a, a, an intellectual concept into something that then evolves on paper? And so very often they're looking for that in the sketchbooks, but also when they assess it. Now music in some ways is quite easy because the directors of music will appear out in Hong Kong and they expect the individual to perform for them. In other areas, such as uh, art and sport, it's very, very difficult to demonstrate that in Hong Kong. And I think you really need to be prepared to spend a day at a UK school where you go through the whole scholarship process. And that could mean a number of hours in the art department or a number of hours out on the sports field or in the gym or whatever it might be. And this sort of talent needs to be backed up um, with references. You need references from the uh, music teacher. You need references from the sports coach if you are at that particular level. And scholarships within the UK system actually mean very little when it comes to money. Most of the big schools have now veered away from these having any monetary value. Uh, some, some will say, yes, they, they have some uh, there is some reduction in fees, but actually this is an honorary scholarship and if uh, an individual's family needs financial support, then they apply for a bursary, just as you would to an American university at, at some point. What it does though, is that it has a huge impact on the academic bar. So in other words, if your minimum entry level is set at this point, what, what I used to do every single year was for our, let's say for our sixth form entry, every name appears on the spreadsheet, the uh, results in the individual tests are all of there, are all there, the interview scores are all there. And at some point we draw a line on the spreadsheet and we say we would like to uh, make offers to all of these above this particular line that we've drawn on the spreadsheet. But just as we will look at those above the line and ask the question, are there any here that we don't want to make offers to? Because they will actually gain very little from us and they won't actually give an awful lot to the community. We would also go quite a considerable distance below that entry um, bar, below the, the cutoff point. See, where are the talents that we want to bring into this school? Where are the musicians? Where are the artists? Where are simply the huge characters? Because these add something to the school community, just, just as Karen was saying about, about American schools. Okay, and then move on to the personal, uh, the, oh yes, I've forgotten about this one, schools for different talents. Yes, I, I think you can, you can say that the very big name schools, the Eatons of this world are going to, going to really provide everything that you would hope for. They are very big, wealthy schools, they have their theatres, they have their amazing art departments and so on. But for instance, if you have somebody who is really chasing a, a, a passion in music, then you could be adding schools like uh, Mayfield, which is a, a girls' school, you could be adding uh, King's Canterbury, uh, Wells Cathedral School. These schools are just one step below the professional so even if you are applying to one of those schools right up at the top of the, of the league table, then I think you should be at least considering some of these. And I mentioned in terms of drama and film, every school has its theatre, every school has a, a, its amazing drama department. But there are some that are really genuinely interesting. And Hertwood House, which is just a, a school for sixth formers for the final two years before universities, they have a major emphasis on film and drama. So well worth looking at. 
and a school that I love, which is B Davis, really quite far down on any league table that you look at. But the art department is absolutely stunning. Most, most sixth formers who are applying to go to art college, generally speaking, have to do a foundation course. If you go to BDLs, you will not have to do that foundation course because that will be part of their whole uh, teaching and their uh, A-level course after school. And of course, when it comes to sport, you can't ignore Millfield, one of the great sporting academies in, in, in the world. With um, it, it not only attracts um, young sports stars from all over the world, but it also attracts coaches. And the current director of sport there was actually in charge of uh, England hockey for quite a number of years. Okay, and on to the uh, personal statement. Now, I would back up almost everything that, that Karen was saying. But whereas the American schools will still expect this essay, this personal statement from the younger age group, the UK schools generally don't. And a personal statement really doesn't have much relevance at all at age 11 plus or 13 plus. Yes, it's lovely to read it. I, um, I, I saw too many that were just too perfect. And, and to be honest, I probably didn't um, treat them very seriously. I just put a, a, a quote there from a, a girl from Portugal who was applying. Um, and even as she was applying for a 16 plus uh, place, and I've said on the slide here that adult and expert interference can really devalue the final product. What I, what I want to hear is I want to hear the voice of the 15-year-old coming through. And I don't mind if there are mistakes in there. I, I don't necessarily want it to be perfect. I don't want to feel that parents, tutors, mentors have all gone over this with a fine tooth. I, would, I, I remember sending through a personal statement very recently where I was able to assure the school that it, it had been totally untouched by parents or by me for that, for that matter. And they, and they really appreciated that fact that you know, this was written by the 15-year-old. I think it can be limited to about 500 words. I don't think there's any need to go uh, any further than that. And one very good reason for writing a personal statement is that to a, a degree you can guide the direction of the interview. Even when I was interviewing at, at Oxford, we used to take the highlighter to all of the personal statements on the, on the university application form. And we would be hunting for those two or three things that, that were genuinely interesting. And in any personal statement, you won't actually find much more than that. You'll be lucky if you find three really interesting things that you'd like to talk to that individual about. And you must, as, as the applicant, you must be prepared to talk about those things. I don't think I'll ever forget the um, personal statement of the girl applying to read uh, geography at Hartford College in, in Oxford. And she had written about camping at the foot of a particular volcano in South America. And of course, I asked her about the, uh, what type of volcano it was, and she actually hadn't got a clue. <laughs> she, she just simply said to me, oh, we only camped there. And, and I thought any um, intellectually curious geographer must know what that volcano was all about. Anyway, so um, that's just simply a cautionary tale. When it, when it comes to um, uh, things like Karen mentioned portfolios and so on. For the UK schools, be careful, don't bombard them with that sort of information. They actually don't want to see huge portfolios, and they don't want to see uh, the certificates. A CV that summarizes those in, uh, on, on one side is more than enough, and the personal statement will, will cover, hopefully, quite a lot of, of the interest and the ambitions and the talents that a particular uh, child has. Okay, and finally, finally, the school reference and the school reports. Now, you can't influence these at the last minute, that's for certain. Schools will look for 
the last two sets of reports, typically the last two sets, maybe even only the last set of, of school reports. And they are very familiar. They see hundreds of school reports coming through from, from Hong Kong. And we know what 75 out of 153 means. And, you know, they, they will look across these, uh, these reports and draw conclusions from them. Now, what they would love to see more of is they'd love to see um, the thoughts of the, of the individual teachers. And you get that much more in a UK school report. Um, you can influence what is written. Of course, the only way you can do that in terms of your work at school is through your performance in class and your performance in your homework. What you can do for there are particular subjects that are important to you is you can approach key teaching, but I wouldn't go for too many. If, if, you're, if your big thing is English or your big thing is biology, then try not get a reference from the biology teacher and ask that biology teacher to write about you as a person and to write about you as um, a, a young budding scientist. Now the schools will ask for a head teacher's report and Eaton has stated here the results of the pretest and the head teacher's report will be reviewed. It's not always possible to get the head teacher to do the report, but the schools will be quite happy if it is a head of year, if it is a form teacher, somebody in authority should be writing that particular report. And I think it is uh, very fair to say to the schools, to explain to the schools what is actually required. And as I was talking about earlier, key talents deserve a separate reference. So a reference from the sports coach, a reference from the art teacher, from the uh, music uh, teacher. These will all help. Okay, I'm, I'm going to sign off there, but we're very happy, obviously, to answer any questions. So I'll hand back to Karen at this point. Great, thank you, Rory. Um, thank you, all of you, for joining us today. Um, I know we have run over, uh, but I did want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. Um, you don't have to unmute yourself. You can send it through chat. Um, so. If you need to sign off, um, please feel free to. Um, we wouldn't be offended. Um, but if you have any questions, please do send some through. Yes, I, th I think that question that has just come through about the, the authority figure not knowing the individual pupil, I, I think schools are very aware of that. And so that's why I say this, this person must have some sort of standing in the school, but it can be a year head or it can be the form teacher and the schools would be very happy with that. What they do want is they, they do want somebody who knows that individual child. Yes, and for the US, um, I think that they do need the math teacher and the English teacher. You are free to submit, um, some of these schools do allow you to submit another reference, a personal reference. Um, and so that could be someone that you interact, your student has interacted with closely and yeah. someone who knows them well. Yeah. And uh, a question there was, uh, is Form 3 too old to uh, apply to the UK? Karen, remind me, where is Form 3 in terms of Hong Kong? What age are we talking about? Uh, we would be talking about 14 to 15. So, okay. Yes. So, so, so no is the, is the answer. I, I mentioned that there are three main entry points. There's the 11 plus, 13 plus, 16 plus, and, and they, um, those are the, are the standard entry points. But every single year, we see some who are coming through at age 14 plus, for instance, and going into what the UK refers to as year 10. And that is the, the first of uh, the two-year program. And the, the two-year program, uh, GCSE program, is the program that is for 14 plus and 15 plus, and they're examined at age 16. And then, of course, you can apply for the sixth form at age 16 and just do the final two years uh, before uh, university. Um, the, the, the other question that I perhaps should raise is everything about last minute applications. I, um, I, I placed um, a girl in, well, I didn't place, but <laughs> a girl was given an offer yesterday from one of the 
main, one of the top boarding schools in the UK. The first that I heard of this girl was 13 days ago. And so she had decided that her international school that she was at really hadn't delivered in the last six months and she wanted something better. Was it possible? And of course, there will always be occasional gaps in, the, uh, in, in any of the boarding schools. And we were lucky enough to come across a number of those gaps and she has already been offered uh, a place at one of the schools and I, ex I expect her to get another offer in the next couple of days as well. So uh, Renee had a question about how we work with students and families. Um, so I'll start off. Um, so we've been, uh, we've, we usually meet with these um, students. We give them about a, a 30 minute complimentary um, meeting. Um, we would prefer to meet with the student if, they, if the timing allows. Um, we go through your, um, your transcript, your grades. Um, ideally, if you have a resume or a list of activities, that would be great as well. Um, and depending on where you are in the application process, uh, we can uh, definitely advise um, on gaps uh, in terms of the profile. It's not really about um, you know, making sure that we are checking the boxes, but then at the same time, it is about demonstrating a little bit of well groundedness so um, so if you are strong in sports then we can talk about and, and only sports um, is there anything else that you might be interested in so I have a student for example during COVID is really into baking so we started talking about okay you like to bake what aspects of it what have you made have you experimented with other uh, different uh, reactive agents and then it becomes a science experiment so um, really is about expanding on what they are already interested in and then seeing how we can further develop um, uh, the inter intellectual uh, capacity, uh, capability or, um, or just round out the profile a little bit more. Um, and then uh, if you are starting to apply, then it moves on to writing the essays and the parent statements. And um, it does take a while. Um, for college and for boarding school, I would say that even for the best writers, we go through about five to 10 different drafts before we get to a point where we are um, we are happy with the final product. It, um, so I do edit, but then it usually isn't very heavy handed. It's more for length and for voice um, and, and grammatical errors here and there. Uh, so we do work quite closely together and um, mostly it's about, I, I call the boarding school application journey um, a journey of self-discovery because really you are evaluating everything you've accomplished up until today um, and how you see yourself in the future. So um, it's very reflective for the parents and it's very reflective students. I think what's interesting about that, Karen, is that that is the exact word that I would use as well. It is a journey. And, you know, the strange thing about this journey is that we may all set off traveling in one direction. And this, this journey can change direction as we go through it. And one of the things that I suppose because of my presentation, I, uh, I was emphasizing this whole business of uh, academic levels and so on, it's very, very important that we understand the academic level of the individual child um, completely. And it would be very negligent of us if we were to head off in the direction of four or five individual schools without really having done a proper academic assessment of the individual child. And, and sometimes that leads us to these standardized age-adjusted tests, like the, the UCASET test, for instance, is one that uh, we use a lot because we know that, the, that the, the schools understand it and we understand it. So what we can do is we can put the individual child in context as far as the UK school is concerned. But again, as Karen was saying, the most, you know, the most important thing at the beginning is for us to actually talk to one another. And so now, of course, we're having Zoom calls all over the world, but uh, these uh, Zoom meetings are so important to understand what the parents are hoping for to try to get an understanding of the individual character of, of the child as well, because character is important. It's going to be, uh, it's almost like a double application. You're applying on the academic side, but you're applying on the character side as well. And we try very hard to understand the individual pupil 
in, in those uh, different areas. And then it, we will progress over a period of time. How, how much time? I, I have worked with uh, individuals from the age of eight when they've been applying um, at age 13. So it could be over a period of years, or in some cases, as I just explained um, a few minutes ago, it was over a period of 13 days. It, it depends on what we're given as to how long we will work with the families. And then, of course, you, you will find that some families are going to take up more time than others. In some situations, maybe more complex than others. But that's fine. We're, we're very aware of, of that. And we will work through the complexity of all of this. Um, the, the guidance that, that we give um, will vary from one student to another student. And if we do, if we do feel that either the individual pupils, or for that matter, even the families themselves are traveling in the wrong direction, we must be brave enough to say that as, as well. Um, sometimes it does feel a bit like uh, um, as though you're hand-holding the whole way through, through the process, but that in, that's what we should be doing. And I suppose it's what we enjoy doing as, as well. Um, one of the things that I'm I always have in the back of my mind is I never want to set anybody up to fail. And so I would hope that anybody going through my hands is a valid candidate for any school that we're applying to. And yes, sometimes we might feel that we're saying, okay, this is the very top of, of what this boy or girl might be capable of achieving. But, you know, let's be aware of that, but we want to give it a go. And, and the other thing that I'm um, also quite concerned about on occasions is if families want to apply to too many schools. I think that can be counterproductive as well. It can put enormous pressure on, on the child. I would prefer to get the selection right than to have lots and lots and lots of schools on, on the list. Um, th there was a question that popped up. Um, something about fa uh, family um, decisions or UK universities. I just missed the text of it. Karen, did you pick that up? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so we'll answer one more question. Um, and the question is from Alice. Is family factors, university choices, the most important factor deciding between US or UK boarding schools? Um, any other factors like school culture? Um, would you say the school cultures are similar amongst the top schools in the US and UK, or would school culture in the US differ in school culture in the UK, and in what ways? Um, so I might take a part of this, uh, just because we have been working with students who've done UK, transferred to the US, and, and vice versa. Um, so I would say, uh, well, it's kind of a cop out, but it depends. Um, Usually, I think that you, you do look at where you want to matriculate for university when you're thinking about uh, boarding schools, um, but it is a very personal choice and family does come into play. Uh, you, when we speak with our students, we do ask, do you have family on the East Coast or the West Coast? Do you have family in the UK? Uh, because having that family support really does, um, does help, especially when uh, kids uh, are so young and uh, in light of the current COVID situation where they had to get a flight out of school and evacuate, that was uh, definitely a very big factor. Um, in terms of university choices, um, I would say that if you wanted to apply, you know, if you, if you have already chosen your boarding school and want to apply to, uh, you know, from the US to the UK or from the UK to the US, uh, the requirements are very different. And for the UK, I think uh, they tend to be quite high. So. Uh, you would have to demonstrate uh, your, uh, you would have to do it in the form of AP exams um, and in the specific subjects for some of these universities. Um, and then uh, the minimum score would be five uh, for some of the more selective universities. And then you would go through uh, the UCAS application process. Um, and then I think I remember talking to Rory a little bit about some of the UK boarding schools actually um, support, uh, being becoming more supportive of students yeah. applying to the US as well. Yes, there's been, a, there's been a huge increase over, actually it's probably over 20, 30 years now, but, but um, I, I was reading the, I was reading the A-level uh, results report, I think it was from Wickham Abbey, just in, in the last um, few weeks, 
and they were talking about the numbers that are going ahead to American universities. So, that, so the UK schools are now very aware that anybody coming from an international background is likely to be looking, to be considering both the UK and, and the US. And I remember a, um, an international family of mine a couple of years ago, their, their girls started a charter house and they were actually quite shocked that in week two, she uh, was going to a, a talk where they were opening up this whole possibility of American universities. And they had they had no interest in American universities. They wanted their girls to go to a UK university. Sorry, and they were just a little bit shocked that uh, she suddenly had this talk. And I was explaining, well, that's exactly what the schools are doing. And you cannot um, approach an American university now unless there is un unless you've been involved in the process for for quite some time. But what I what I tend to find is that Hong Kong families who are looking at UK schools have either some sort of connection with the UK. It may be that there are relatives here, it may not be. It may be that they were educated at university level in, in the UK, or it, it may be that simply the UK is just that little bit more familiar. Um, but increasingly, um, Karen, we're, we're finding, of course, that there are families who are, who are looking at both. Uh, the difficulty with that is that you're not just, you're not just doubling your workload, It's uh, a huge ask on, on the part of families to deal with both UK and now I'm 20 years ago. They were also looking at European, the world at least up until um, COVID, uh, much further afield. Um, hi everyone, I just wanted to pop in and say hello. Uh, my name is Renee Bowie. I'm founder of Baker and Bloom, and I wanted to also thank Karen and Rory for wrapping up our Inspired, and um, I guess just to chip in on this vital question about comparing the U.S. and the U.K., I've studied in both countries, and we've worked with many students who are applying to college from both U.S. and U.K. boarding schools, um, and I think that one distinction is in the extracurricular arena, because I think both U.S. and U.K. share a lot of commonalities in terms of the uh, level of academics, the rigor, the facilities, and also the, um, the heavier emphasis on discussion-based learning than in Hong Kong. But I think one area where things where they depart from each other is that um, in the U.S., extracurriculars are pursued much more seriously and, and uh, vigorously because they can get you into college. Um, you can be recruited for sports. Uh, if you're, you have exceptional musical talent, that also can land you somewhere. Um, and so there's, I would say, almost like a near 50-50 emphasis um, in terms of academics to extra, with extracurricular. Whereas I think in the UK, uh, there certainly are extensive options offered in sports, which is also a requirement, as well as clubs and societies. I feel that um, the purpose of them is much more the uh, come stems from this desire for a holistic offering a holistic education and experience to uh, balance out the academic um, activities that the students are engaged in. Whereas I think in the U.S., uh, for whatever reason it is, culturally speaking, uh, the extracurriculars can dominate your weekends. Uh, I remember as part of the debate team. Just like working the whole Saturday night prepping for your whole day of tournaments on Sundays. Um, and I find that there's also a greater space and freedom to start your own clubs uh, among my U.S. students uh, than the U.K. So it does not mean you cannot pursue. So on the other hand, though, I have to say, I think that sometimes in the U.K., because everybody's doing three to four subjects in their final years and not more than that, not that it is a very demanding, but that does mean you and choose, you have more liberty to choose and pursue other things in your spare time. Whereas a lot of U.S. students are taking five to six courses, and that's a very heavy workload sometimes, 
So, um, yeah, there's a little bit of difference, I think, in that area. But, um, Karen, would you like to wrap up our talk? Yes. Um, so thank you for joining today. Thank you, Rory, for, uh, for dialing in as well from the UK. Um, if you have any questions, um, the contact information is all in this final slide. Feel free to reach out to us for any additional questions or inquiries you may have. Um, and we can put you in touch, uh, well, they can put you in touch with myself, Renee, or Rory if you um, need any of our support. Thanks so much for joining mm -hmm. us, everyone. I hope you can tell that our counselors care a lot about getting to know individual families and students so that whether it is coming up with um, the right angle for your essay and finding your voice uh, or choosing the right school and making sure it's the right fit, as Rory was talking about, we're really committed to that and able to do that because we take the time to get to know the student and we see it as much more than just about getting into a school but throughout this journey of applying, helping the students learn more about themselves and how to present themselves to others. So would love to work with any of you and uh, do get in touch. Have a great weekend, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>